For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. This season, let us celebrate the arrival of our Savior, the King of Kings, Prince of Peace, Emmanuel, Jesus. We've been doing a, a series leading up to Christmas. And we've done hope, last week joy, today we would title the message, uh, Pathways uh, to Peace. And I just want to read a couple of passages of Scripture, one that you're very familiar with. If you have a Bible, to turn to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2. Beginning in verse 8, there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock. An angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them. They were greatly afraid. The angel said, don't be afraid, for I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David, which would be Bethlehem, a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. I also want to just draw your attention real quickly to a very, another familiar verse from Isaiah chapter 9, which I'm just going to read a few verses. For unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given. The government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and then Prince of Peace. Peace. I googled it. It means freedom from disturbance, freedom from unrest, a state of tranquility and quietness, you know, like Christmas. <laughs> Calm, restful. Another definition is, is to be free of conflict or war. Now, most of you have heard of, I'm sure, the Nobel Peace Prize. It was created by a man by the name of Alfred Nobel, a Swiss scientist. It's a prize awarded to a person who has done the most and best for brotherhood between nations, for the reduction of standing armies, and for the holding and promotion of peace talks or congresses around the world. Now here's why Alfred Nobel established the Nobel Peace Prize. He's the inventor of dynamite. I don't know if you knew that. With that invention, and really a, a host of ones that he invented with patents, uh, he became an extremely wealthy man. Never married, a confirmed bachelor, never had any children, and in 1888, at the age of 58, he was visiting France. His brother was over there. His brother was fighting tuberculosis, and his brother passed away there in France. And they ran an obituary in the French newspaper, and they got the story all wrong. They thought that it was Alfred who had died. And the title of the obituary was this, true story, The Merchant of Death is Dead. So he, he reads this news article, which was fake news. They had fake news back in 1888. <laughs> he, he reads it, and he's like so impacted by it, so concerned that one day he might be remembered as the merchant of death, that he decided to write a will and he set aside 94% of his estate, which today would be about $240 million, he set it aside to establish prizes. The first one was to be the Nobel Peace Prize. And then there was a, a, a prize for chemistry, physics, literature, medicine, and, and economics. But... 
a man known as the merchant of death is the guy who established the Nobel Peace Prize. And at Christmas time, we read about, sing about, talk about peace. I, I, I got some symbols I wanted to throw up here that, that are common to us about peace. Uh, you guys know, most of you from the 60s know, know this one, right? And then there's that one at the top, which is interesting. I try to find out where did that symbol come from? And it came from England. And I guess there's these guys who, who, who uh, do signs with flags on ships in other ways, called semaphore, I think it's called. And, and, and what that actually means, it's two letters, N, I guess N and D, I'm not sure which is which. And it means nuclear disarmament. I'm sorry for all you believers who think it's a broken cross and it doesn't mean peace. But it's nuclear disarmament. So, so that became, those two became extremely popular for some reason with, now I try to find out what this means. And it's really difficult to find the origin of this. I do know that in its early stage, if you did it this way over in England, it meant something totally different. And I won't tell you what that is. Some of you know, I see. Hallmark sells cards with peace. We sing about peace. Silent night, holy night, you just heard it. You know, sleep in heavenly peace, sleep in heavenly peace. There's, it came upon a midnight clear. It says, peace on earth, goodwill to men from heaven's all gracious king. There's all kinds of songs sung about peace. Hark the herald angels sing, peace on earth and mercy mild. In our world, in our nation, even right now, there's not so much peace. When we all watch the huge debacle in Afghanistan, just kind of shocked by what happened, the unrest and tension of lockdown COVID presidential election that created all kinds of, well, unrest in our nation, in our culture. We, 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 we are dealing with the whole vaccine thing and the booster and the booster and the booster and the booster. That's like creating all kinds of issues. The, the nightmare of required masks that keeps coming and going back and forth. And when you travel, if you travel on the planes, uh, you, you, uh, if you have recently, and you know, the minute you step into the airport and get on an airplane, you got to wear that mask. And they've hired Nazis to come up and down the, the aisles to, <laughs> to, to yell at you, and you know, like, it's insane. There's rising inflation, there's rising violence, there's the defunding and disrespect of peace officers, there's gender confusion fiasco, there's abortion battle, and to all that, all I can say is, Merry Christmas, peace on earth. <laughs> right? I mean, it's crazy. And here we are in the midst of uh, Christmas, and we're thinking of and singing about peace. And our, our world, our culture offers all kinds of pathways uh, to peace. There's meditation. You know, you can, you can clear your mind. Some, some people practice transcendental meditation where you, you have a mantra and the whole thing is just to completely clear your mind. And I would submit to you that it's the complete opposite of biblical meditation, which is to focus your mind on the Lord and His truth and His Word. There's, there's exercise that people use to, to get this sort of euphoric, uh, endophoric ecstasy. There's, there's entertainment where people find rest and relaxation and peace by, you know, binging on the latest whatever, series, whatever it might be. There's concerts, there's sporting events, there's video games that people lose themselves in, there's road trips, there's food, there's shopping, there's drugs, there's alcohol, there's the drug of money. There's even a, a branch of psychology called peace psychology. You say, well, what is that? It's a homostatic psychological state which results in a lobotomy. No, it doesn't result in a lobotomy. <laughs> It'd be interesting if it did. 
but that's not what it results in. It results in optimal functioning of the mind. Now, I believe all these paths, these approaches to peace that the world offers, that the culture gives, have never and will never fix our true peace problem. It just won't. And here's why. Peace is not an emotional, circumstantial, or psychological issue. I believe it's mostly a spiritual issue and a heart issue. And that's why a Savior came. And when He came, that's why it says in the Scriptures, He'll be the Prince of Peace. He's the one that can truly bring peace. Listen again to just this simple announcement in the Gospel of Luke. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. That's the announcement when he's born. That, that there, there will be peace on the earth. The God who is, is, is the, the highest, and that's how he's described here. Glory to God in the highest. The God who, who has all strength and power and, 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 and knowledge brings peace without equal to mankind. I mean, think about the story. You got these shepherds, they're they're hanging out in this sort of podunk village in Bethlehem, you know, five to seven or eight miles from Jerusalem. If you've ever been there, it's just right near there. You can almost drive to the edge of Jerusalem and see the fields of Bethlehem. And they're out there. It's a very small village at this time. And it's just another night for these shepherds. They're hanging out on those hillsides, watching their sheep. And, you know, I'm sure they're just kind of discussing, same old, same old. Here we are, another night with these stinking sheep. And, and it says, they're, they're there, and it'd be kind of like this. You get this word, behold. <laughs> right? And suddenly the light's in your eyes. Let's keep it that way the rest of the message. Now bring it back, bring it back. <laughs> so suddenly, there's the word behold, and whenever you see that word in Scripture, it's like, boom, something's about to happen. And the angel of the Lord appears. It's suddenly like daylight. They're freaked out, they're, they're, you know, they're afraid, and, and you can imagine they would be, because here's the deal. These are angels, these are shepherds, these are people. These are heavenly beings, and all people are sinners. And suddenly angels are looking down at you. You're probably thinking, we're done for. This is it. The Scripture declares that you and I and all mankind, well, that we're born in iniquity. We're born sinners. It's like that song, I don't remember who wrote it, get your motor running like a true nature child, you were born, born to be wild. And that's how we're born. I mean, if you've ever had kids, you know that's true, right? Born to be wild. You got to tame those little rascals. (laughs) And you pray they get saved. Rebellious from birth, Every one of us, born without a relationship with the Lord, and there's always a price, there's always a consequence, there's always a wage, the Bible says, for rebellion. Romans chapter 6, verse 23 says it pretty clearly. It says, for, well, let's see, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus So there's a wage that we pay. There is a price for our sin. There's physical death. But worse, there is spiritual death. The inability to experience the the fullness of life that God has for you and for me when we're in a right relationship with Him. To come into a relationship with the Lord. 
And I, I know a lot of people, good people, great people, who are not believers. They have good jobs. They're successful materially. Their, their kids seem, for the most part, normal. And their marriages are okay. They're engaged in life. But here's the thing. Without Christ, you're not experiencing the fullness and completeness that comes to you that only comes from Him. You can't get it from family. You can't get it from your spouse. You can't get from other people what Christ offers, His hope, His joy in the midst of sorrowful circumstances that we all walk through. You, you can't uh, count upon His promises for life as an unbeliever. You, you don't find his, his truth and His values being shaped in your own life, demonstrated by your character as you grow. You don't have the inward reality of His presence that my spirit bears witness with His spirit that I'm His child. You can't have these things without Him. We become God's child. And we're no longer rebels. Now we belong to Him. No longer outcasts. Forgiven of all our wrongs and rebellion. See, here's, here's the thing. Listen. Christ came as prophesied in Scripture. And He took our place on the cross. He, he died for your sins and my sins. And if we trust in Him, if we surrender ourselves to Him, He takes away our guilt and shame and reveals to us the lies of the enemy. The lies of the enemy. So we can be free from the penalty of sin and the power of sin. And part of the power of sin on a person's life is this. Listen, the power of guilt. Walking around with that in your life and in your heart and in your mind without Christ, always sensing and feeling a bit guilty. The shame that comes with it sometimes. Well, I did this and I know I did that. The, the hurt and the rejection that sometimes impacts your life that only Christ really can truly heal. These are some of the, you know, the, 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 the power of sin in our life, the, the sense of aloneness. Even if you have lots of friends without Christ, there always seems to be the sense of, I'm missing something, and, and, I, and I feel alone. And, and add to that not only those things, but the power of sin is also having this fear of death. See, see one of the very first pathways to peace is forgiveness. That, that's the number one thing that we have. Uh, forgiveness is the, is the beginning of our experience with God's peace. When he, when he forgives us, He takes away that guilt, that shame, that hurt, that aloneness. And it brings into your life the peace of God. I'll never forget when I first became a Christian, it was like this giant burden was lifted off my shoulders. And I suddenly began to realize what it meant to be at peace with the Lord. This is part of that pathway when, when you find yourself forgiven by the Lord. It's an amazing thing. We're no longer a rebel. We're forgiven. And now that I'm forgiven, now that I'm walking with the Lord, here's what needs to happen next. And this is kind of the second step, if you will, in the pathway to peace. I really need to let Him lead and guide and be in control. I need to surrender. That's the next point. First, I receive Him as a Savior, and then I need to surrender to Him as my Lord. To let Him lead, to let Him truly guide my life, to really let the Lord be in control. See, sometimes we think that we have to be in control. You guys know any control freaks? Don't look at anyone right now. But do you know any control freaks? You might be one. We, we think we can fix everything, and we got to fix everybody. You ever had anyone try to fix you? You know, most time when you get married, one of you thinks you're going to fix the other one, but you can't really. It's impossible. 
I'm going to fix myself. I remember before I became a Christian, every New Year, so I'm going to fix myself. I'm going to turn over a new leaf. Or I'm going to fix my family. I'm going to fix my brother or sister. You, everybody here has one crazy brother or sister, right, that you're going to fix. I'm going to fix those people at work. I'm going to fix my neighbors. You, you might have a, a position of authority or, or a type of personality that you think, well, well, I'm going to make it happen. I'm going to fix these people. Well, let me put it this way. You and I kind of take on responsibilities to fix people that we really can't handle. We'll never accomplish. Not even called to do it. And it, it wrecks your peace. Because you're always thinking how I can, you know, come from this angle or that angle. You know, the Apostle Peter, he was a guy who I think in the beginning of his relationship with the Lord was a fixer. Now, Lord, no, uh, far be it from you. You're not going to do that. You're not going to the cross. He's the guy in the garden with the, the sword. He's going, to make, he's going to fix this if it gets out of control. He's the one that was always saying, yeah, though, though these other guys, I couldn't fix them, but I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. But later in Peter's life, even with a lot of authority and even with a lot of experience, listen to what he says now. I'll just read it to you from 1 Peter. He says the elders, speaking to leaders, people who fix things, who are among you, I exhort, I who am a fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ, are partaker of the glory that will be revealed. Here's what he says. He says, shepherd the flock, which is among you, serving as an overseer, not by compulsion, but willingly. Not for dishonest gain, but, but eagerly. Not being lords over those entrusted to you, but hey, be an example to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, this is what he says, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. Likewise, you younger people, submit to your elders, you submissive to one another. Be, be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, he gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Cast all your cares on him, for he cares for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Don't try to control, he says, by your authority, your position, by some title that you have or some situation you've been placed in. Don't be so heavy-handed. Don't lead with compulsion, he says. Be rather an example to people of a servant. Humble yourselves, he says, before the Lord. And then he has this verse, verse 7, which is, Cast all your cares upon Him because He cares for you. you. You can't carry it all, He says. The responsibility, the authority, or, or whatever you might think you have, tell it to someone with real power and authority. Cast all your cares on Him. Tell it to the Lord, right? That's what He's saying. No matter what your role, be an example to others, not some know-it-all, always pointing out their issues their flaws, and their faults. But you be sober, he says. Be vigilant, because the devil walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. And he devours those who are proud and full of compulsion and always have to be right and in control. You say, but John, if I don't do it, oh, I know. It won't get done. It'll get done if you cast all your cares on him. And if you trust him, if you be an example of what he's called you to do. In Isaiah chapter 26, I want, to, I want you to see this verse. You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever 
For in Yah, which is the word for Yahweh, the Lord is an everlasting strength. Be, begin to trust in the Lord, the one you've surrendered to. Peace is not found in me controlling everything. Peace is found in surrendering to him who is in control. Let me say that again. Peace is not found in me always being in control, but in surrendering to him who truly is in control. The pathway to peace is, number one, it's forgiveness, where the guilt and the shame and the, not only the penalty, but the power of sin is taken off my life. And then surrendering to the Lord as I follow Him, truly giving myself over to Him. And, and, and one more, the final one, pathway to peace, is relationship. An ongoing, consistent relationship with the Lord. I'm forgiven. I, I, I've surrendered to Him. And now I begin to enter into an ongoing, real, commitment, committed relationship to Him. Remember Peter in the boat with all the disciples and that huge storm comes and they think they're going to die? It, it, the boat is rocking. They're all distracted. They're they're, they're, they're thinking this is it. And Jesus appears on the water walking. Lord, if that's you, Peter says. Everyone else, no one, no one else is saying, hey, Lord, is it just Peter? I, I don't know if they're too busy, you know, taking water out of the boat, if they're panicked or, or what is too afraid, too distracted, too busy. But one guy that day, other than Jesus, walks on water. He walks right through the very thing that completely freaked him out a few minutes ago. He's walking through the storm with his eyes on Jesus. Powerfully and confidently, he goes through the storm. Well, you, you know he took his eyes off the Lord. You know that. And he began to sink. And I want you to know that there's always going to be wind. There's always going to be waves. There's always going to be storms. There's always going to be problems. And there's a great place for you and I to focus our eyes to build a relationship with Jesus Christ. I, I was in Sam's Warehouse Club the other day with my wife and desperately looking for gifts for lots of grandkids. And I ran into, like coming right down the aisle at me, an old friend that I went to high school with, even junior high school with. And I hadn't seen him in a while. See, I've got this difficult relationship thing with people. I, I know people from, I grew up here. I was born here. So I know people from grade school, from junior high, from high. I know people from the surfing community that I was real involved in for a long time. And I know people from church. And when I see them, I don't know from what stage I know them from. And I'm like, <laughs> okay, well, I know this guy. Where do I know him from? Is it church? Is it surfing? Is it high school? Is it junior high? Did he beat me up and I don't know, and, but I recognized him, and I said, hey, Tommy, got his name right. I go, how you doing? He had his wife with him, he said, he's pushing a cart, and, 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 and Tommy, if you're watching this, I'm sorry, but you look a lot older than me, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Don't we all feel that way, though? So, so, so there he is, and, and I say, hey, man, what are you doing now? We're about the same age. And he goes, well, I, I retired a couple years ago. I go, okay. Well, what do you do, what, what do, you do with yourself when, you, when you're in that situation? And he goes, well, it seems like I keep pretty busy. He goes, by the time I, I fix one thing at the house that broke down, it seemed like there's another one I got to fix. And I said, yeah, that's called life, isn't it? And, and, and the, that kind of stuff never goes away. There's always something that pops up. You get this done, and now, now there's this. It's amazing. We, we keep our eyes on Him. We stay connected to Him. And as Peter says, let's cast our cares on Him as we walk through life, as we build a relationship 
Listen to what Jesus says to his disciples about sorrow and difficulties and hard times. In John 16, verse 33, it says, These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. He said, in me, as you spend time with me, as you walk with me, as you're forgiven by me, as you surrender to me as Lord, and as you maintain a relationship with me. See, here, here's the challenge. Keeping our life focused on Him as our source of peace. Keeping a relationship with Him daily. I mean, wasn't it interesting in the very first Christmas when Mary and Joseph show up in Bethlehem that there's no room for Him at all? And I think it's quite a commentary on our world, on mankind, that if we're not careful, we fill our lives with everything else but Him. And we wonder why we don't have peace. We wonder why, I, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't. Isn't He supposed to be the Prince of Peace? Yeah, He is. If you keep your mind on Him and your heart with Him and cast all your cares upon Him, we can crowd Him out of our life, with all the drama, with all the busyness, the social media, the job, the, the winds and the waves and the storms, and we can completely go through life, even as a believer, I think, and miss the peace of the Prince of Peace without a daily, consistent, just kind of abiding in Him. In Luke chapter 1, and I'll, I'll read it for you, there's an interesting story about the birth of Jesus we have this prophecy of Zechariah. And it says, And you, child, will be called prophet of the highest. For you will go before the face of the Lord to prepare His way, to give knowledge of salvation to His people by the remission of their sins. Through the tender mercy of our God, with which the day spring from on high has visited us, to give light to those who sit in darkness in the shadow of death and to guide our feet into the way of peace. See, here's, here's the prophecy. We come to Him through forgiveness and salvation. We, 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 we come out of the darkness, and as it says here, you know, those who sit in darkness in the shadow of death. We, we come out of that darkness into this amazing light of truth and, and His relationship with us, and He guides us if we'll listen, if we stay connected in the way of peace. That's a life of, of following Jesus. I, I love this passage, to give light to those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death and to guide our feet in the way of peace. He brings light and He brings peace. I mean, Jesus wept over Jerusalem. They, 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 they missed the way of peace. Remember when Jesus was, was there in, in Luke chapter 19? Remember that, that passage of Scripture? I don't think I have that one on the thing. In Luke chapter 19, there's a... Jesus weeping over the city of Jerusalem. And, and listen to what he says. And as he drew near, he saw the city and wept over it. And this is what he said. If you had known, even you, especially in your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. If you had just stopped and realized who I was. When we listen, when we hear His voice, when we are in relationship with Him, when we stop and allow ourselves to, to, to hear His voice, we, we, can, we can experience, I believe, His peace. Listen to Isaiah chapter 48. Listen to this passage, verse 17. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, I am the Lord your God, 
who teaches you to profit, who leads you by the way you should go. Oh, that you had heeded my commandments. Then your peace would have been like a river and your righteousness like the waves of the sea. Listen, I don't want to be, and I hope you don't want to be, one of those people who says over and over again in their life, if only I had listened to what the Lord was saying to me. If only I would have done what he said. And that's what he's saying here, Isaiah, that the Lord will lead us and guide us into peace. Listen, Alfred Noble did not want to be remembered as the merchant of death. So he established at great expense the Nobel Peace Prize. When people think of you, when your name comes up in a conversation, what comes to mind? Oh, so peaceful, so full of peace. Or is it, man, he, she, they're, they're always so busy, they're, they get the job done, they're hard workers, they're always intense, a little uptight, a control freak. Peace is not found in control. Are being overprepared with all these safety nets. You know, well, I'm working on this, you know, 401k, I've got this IRA, I've got a Roth, I've got this. You, you hear it in our culture today. I, I, I hear this, you know, you can be anything you want to be, just believe in yourself. I can be anything I want to be, yeah, just believe in yourself. Whatever you put your mind to, you can do it and be it. And it sounds great. It's very motivating. It's just not biblical. It's all self-focus. Here's what I believe the Bible says. You can be who God's called you to be. You can be who God's wired you to be. You can be who God designed you to be. And there's great peace in that. Lord, who do you want me to be? Not, I'm going to be whoever I want. No, I believe in, I believe in ambition. I believe in goals and, and work. But self-focus, all about me succeeding, all about me, is not tied to God's plan and certainly not tied to God's calling. He has a call. He has a plan. And you'll choose one of them. The, the self-focus plan usually ends up in competition, uh, conflict, and constant comparison to those who are going down the same path. You know, there, there's a lot said about social media today, and the whole world's involved in it. Everybody's doing this. Everybody. No matter where you go or where you sit, everybody's doing this, looking at social media. And it's amazing, as you look at the posts, how much of life today is spent trying to look happy. You look at pe people's Post to go, wow, they're happy. Why, why am I not that, that happy? Wow, look, look, look at, they're so authentic. <laughs> they're, 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 their life is so, so wonderful. Meanwhile, they're using all these filters to make themselves look authentic. Isn't that amazing? Don't let life be all about getting something. Don't let life be all about being somebody. Not even getting something from God. The, the pathway to peace, I think, is it's forgiveness first, it's surrender second, and finally it boils down to a daily relationship with Him. Not getting something from God all the time, but just to know Him. Just to walk with Him. You know, it's, it's Jesus who said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and I've got all kinds of demands and expectations and, and things you better do. And that's not what he says. He says, if you open the door, I've got a list. You know. He said, if you'll just open that door, I just want to come in. I just want to sit down with you. I just want to have a relationship with you. And if you open that door, he comes in. And the first thing he does is he forgives. He washes away all your sin. 
He takes away that sense of, you know, what's missing in my life? He, he, he promises that from that time on, you'll never be alone. And he says, look, you don't have to fear death anymore because now you're mine. And I prepared a place for you that you'll be where I am. It's, it's a great hope. It's a great promise. It, it brings great peace. I don't have to try and control everything anymore. I can cast all my cares on him because I finally found someone who truly cares for me. And I have a relationship with the Lord. And when Jesus knocks on the door of your heart, he's coming to forgive. He's coming to allow you to just surrender and then draw you into a relationship with the Lord who loves you and wants to give peace to you. That's what he's all about. There, there is, I believe, even in the midst of all the crazy stuff that's going around in our world, in our culture, there is a pathway to peace. I don't think it's the psychological peace method. I'm pretty sure it's not drugs and alcohol, because most people who come to the end of that have very little peace. I don't think it's all about ambition and success. That doesn't seem to bring it. But there is a pathway with the Lord, and it includes Forgiveness, surrender, and the simple walking out of a daily relationship with him where you can just say, Lord, and, and here's the deal. Every single one of us have storms in our life. And you never know when they're going to pop up. You never know when they're going to occur. But here's reality. They occur, don't they? And you want to be able to say, Lord, I need to give this to you. I need to trust you with this. And I know you're going to walk with me through this. And I would submit to you that the Prince of Peace, the one the angel said, peace on earth, goodwill to men, offers you and I this peace, as Scripture declares it, that passes understanding. And there is a pathway with him. And I don't want to be the guy at the end of my life said, oh gosh, I wish I would have just listened to him and walked the path that he called me to. You and I have the amazing privilege of knowing and surrendering and walking with the one the scriptures call the Prince of Peace. Amen?